definitely want to thank Medi with M Cube Technologies for sponsoring the day. Um, they're a great company here in Lawrence and a great asset for anybody who is looking to get some cyber help with their business. And that's what we're here to talk about today is the concepts of cybersecurity and small business and how it's going to affect this world, this digital world that we really found ourselves in. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. So a lot of you in the room know me, a lot of you don't. So I'll just kind of start talking about who I am. I'm Brian Dennis. Uh, I work for the Kansas Small Business Development Center here at the University of Kansas. My office is actually uh, up at CapFed Hall. I've been with KSBDC since 2013. Um, and when I started with them, I was a business advisor, but quickly began getting into more of disaster uh, recovery and business continuity measures within the organization and that's because of my experience and just by being in a room with me you are all putting yourselves at risk I want you to know um, I am kind of a disaster magnet uh, I have been through more hurricanes than I'd like to talk about I, I'm originally from South Louisiana as you can tell from my very thick Cajun accent um, but I was born and raised on the bayous of South Louisiana and uh, was in New Orleans for Hurricane Katrina in 2005. It was in New Orleans for Hurricane Rita in 2005, which was 30 days later. A lot of folks don't remember that. Uh, again, I was in New Orleans for Hurricane Gustav in eight, and in uh, 2008, and uh, we had another one right after that, Hurricane Ike. And so we were rebuilding businesses in South Louisiana after hurricanes. Um, you start naming disasters, I've been a part of them somewhere or another. Uh, my company thought I was getting burned out during Katrina uh, after the recovery process, and so they sent me to a very nice resort in California for two weeks to relax, and they had the largest earthquake they'd ever had while I was there. Um, at another point, I was flying uh, out of Washington, D.C. after a meeting talking about recovery aspects, and the plane caught on fire. And so, you know, we actually landed safely, but yeah, I, I have really filled out my disaster bingo card. I'm waiting for a volcano to erupt somewhere, and I think I'll have it done. But I'm also a business continuity uh, professional, and so there's actually an organization that certifies people in taking businesses through disasters. Uh, and I also have a Master's of Emergency Management and Homeland Security from Arizona State University. And so I am really focused on the concepts of what is a disaster within a business. And when we start talking about small businesses and the types of interruptions that they're facing these days, people forget about their largest one that's out there. We can worry about fire, we can worry about tornadoes here in Kansas, we can worry about floods, uh, but our businesses are not concerned about cybersecurity and they should be. Uh, the numbers are staggering. Right now we know that small businesses and nonprofits are a target. And these figures are actually old. Um, when this figure was put together, we were saying that 43% of, of, of uh, attacks are happening against small business. Today that number is over 50%. 90% of, of actual successful cyber attacks, successful breaches are happening against small businesses. When corporate America is spending 1% of total revenues, which equals to about $2 trillion right now on cybersecurity, and the average small business these days spends nothing, it's easy to figure that out. Uh, we know that 60% of companies that have a major breach within their offices will not recover. Uh, within six months, they will shut their doors and never reopen again. And that number is staggering, and it gets even worse when we talk about what happens with a breach. The average cost of a cybersecurity breach for a small business today is $117,000. Who has that lying around? Nobody. You're not going to have $117,000 to pick up the tab of a cyber attack. And so that's what we really want to focus on. What we know today is that our businesses just aren't aware of the threat. Um, you know, we can pick up a Pick, pick, who picks up a paper anymore? You can read a paper online uh, or follow the news and understand that cyber issues are everywhere. Um, we learn about it in national politics. We learn about it in huge hacks that we see with Equifax and Target and Marriott recently. Um, but the, the, there's a very he, big gap when it comes to small businesses. Our small businesses just don't understand that they are the target. Um, increased scrutiny from liability and liability from our partners, people aren't thinking about that. There's a lot of infrastructure that goes into setting up deals these days, specifically when we talk about banking and insurance, and we want to make sure that we're covered. Uh, there is no business-wide education for cybersecurity today. Um, our small business owners, the 28 million small business owners across the United States, have had zero education opportunities for cyber, and that's something that we've got to change, and that's what we're trying to change within the SBDC offices. A lot of people worry about the cost. 
and this is one of the areas that I try to focus on a lot is that you know we know corporate America has put it on their P&Ls. Corporate America is spending dollars right now to make a difference and small business is not. We have got to catch up and so we've got to begin understanding how can we allocate budget dollars to make sure that we can protect ourselves. Uh, and then the actual act of recovery after being a victim. Um, the, no one has a plan set in stone as for how you're going to deal with a cyber attack. Uh, when I talk to businesses about you know, interruptions and what would they do in case of a disaster, a lot of them have a phone list and they know, well, I'll call this guy and this guy will call this guy and we'll know where everyone is. Um, but what about how do you re recover after being a, an attack, a, a cyber attack? How do you get through that? And then the support network doesn't exist. When we talk about opportunities uh, to recover after a cyber attack in Kansas, we have to talk uh, not just about guys like Medi and M-Cube. We need to talk about attorneys that are specifically educated in how can they help our, our small businesses. Cyber-specific attorneys in Kansas really don't exist. We have a very small handful that can really help with that. Insurance companies that know the risk and know the dangers. We, we just don't have that support network and that's what we're really trying to build. And so what we've built here within the Kansas Small Business Development Center is a first of its kind opportunity. So there have been other states that have tried to build a system that potentially could just give people a warning as to this is what you should worry about when you're, we talk about cybersecurity. What we're really trying to do is to change that with education and assessments. Uh, we're, we're helping to manage that threat and most importantly, what we want to do is foster innovation. If we can see our small businesses making distinct changes, we're going to see an improvement. And the program that we've built, we've built in conjunction with a lot of really interesting and very smart people. Um, I've worked closely with uh, the Air Force here in Kansas. We actually have one of the coolest things ever, and a lot of people don't know this, but at McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita is the one of the best red team hacking squads in the world. Um, these are, you know, Air Force personnel, and they all have ranks like Colonel and Major, and you know, but they don't look like it. You know, you walk into their offices, and they're all sitting in hoodies, sitting in front of a computer. Um, but they are actively hacking infrastructure. They're actively hacking businesses. They're actively hacking governments, um, just to say that you know we have an issue. And they're they're a really interesting group of guys to work with, and we've helped. They've helped design a lot of what we do. We've worked closely with the FBI. We've worked with actual groups like the Re National Restaurant Association. A lot of people don't realize, but restaurants are under attack like never before right now, and they need to understand what they can do to help. The American Bar Association has been a partner, as well as the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission is actually the organization that's tasked with trying to deal with the cyber crime issue, uh, and they can't do it. They, they are overworked and underpaid, and they just don't have the opportunities to do it, and so they're hoping to partner with folks like us. So when we launched this program, we started looking at what could we compare it to and how could we actually put it together. And so we, we built it using the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology Framework. And that really focuses on five key areas. The first is identify. We want to figure out within our businesses who is responsible, what devices need protecting, you know, what operating systems are you using. When I start asking our businesses these questions, a lot of folks just don't know. Um, they know that they have a desktop computer, they don't know the latest version, they don't know if they've updated it, they don't know what protections they've got in it. And then following that up with Identify is we protect. How are you currently protecting your system? This is insane to say, but most small businesses in Kansas do not have virus protection on their computers. They have let it expire. Um, I'm sure Medi slaps his head against a wall when I say this, but a lot of companies go out and buy computers off the shelf. And when you do that, it most of those computers will come with a one year's free subscription to some type of virus protection. Um, and it's a bad virus protection at that. And so what you're left with is a year goes by, that, comp that little box starts popping up, and what do they do? They click ignore because they're tired of seeing that box pop up. And so they're vulnerable. And the 244,000 businesses and small businesses in Kansas right now, the majority of them have no virus protection. And you're doing business with them. And so whenever you give them your credit card to swipe, whenever you send them an invoice and they're going to send maybe back a payment, or whenever you send a payment to them, how sure can you be guaranteed that that is actually protected? Uh, small businesses in Kansas have no way, and they don't understand how to actually detect if they've been breached or not. The average cybersecurity breach for a corporation right now, we know it will be six months usually before they know anything. Most small businesses have already been breached and don't know it. 
Um, your data could be siphoned off and you have no idea if you don't have some type of identity, some type of way to actually identify and detect these issues. And then we get to the actual response issue. Um, responding to a cyber attack is like responding to a fire. You know, it, you have to respond quickly. You have to respond with a sense of urgency. If you find out that your company has been breached and that data has been stolen and you wait six months to tell anyone about it, you potentially are viable for huge amounts of felonies now. I mean, there are all kinds of issues that, are dealing, that we're dealing with. And then the recovery process. It is not an easy process. Recovering from a cyber attack uh, you know, I spent two years in New Orleans after Katrina rebuilding our businesses. Uh, Katrina hit on August 29th, 2005. We lost, we had 37, 37 locations of the, sh the coffee shops that I was running at the time, and we lost 22 of them. I spent the next two years rebuilding those 22 stores. We only, we, we rebuilt 21, one of them blew up, and there was nothing we could do about that. But the recovery process on that, we knew there was a date. We knew there was an end time, and we knew that we could get back and actually be back, and be back up and running. After a cyber breach, how do you do that? You know, I like to compare it to uh, Pet World here in Lawrence. Everybody remembers when Pet World had their fire. Um, Pet World had the fire um, and the community rallied around this business. And it's great to see that the community cared so much about a small business. People showed up to volunteer to help them in the recovery process. Um, people liked them on Facebook and said great things about how much they loved this business. And the second that they got a temporary location open, people were there shopping. And when they were back in their permanent location, people showed up in droves. If that had been a cyber breach, and if Pet World had to let every single one of their customers know that your credit card data has been breached, for the next two years, you're going to have to monitor your credit. You have to go freeze your credit cards and get new ones. People would have shown up with torches to burn the building down. And, and so how do you recover from this? It's a PR nightmare that a lot of businesses just aren't prepared for. And so in doing this, we have developed some ideas on how we can start figuring out where we are today within our small businesses and what can we do to actually assess. And so we've built an assessment that is specifically built for our small businesses. We try not to make it too overly complicated. We try not to fill it with a lot of tech words that just you just can't get. Um, but what we can do is we can actually identify a percentage level of risk within your business if you take this survey. <laughs> Uh, this is survey assessment. It's actually available on our website, kansassbdc.net, um, and you can find it there, or you can actually email me or email Will, Christina, or Taylor, and they can get it to you. And what this assessment does is it gives you an idea based on those five categories of identify, detect, protect, respond, and recover uh, to understand where you really need to focus. You may be doing great on the protection side. You may have up-to-date virus protection, and you can potentially not have to focus so much on that. But you may have no clue as to how to actually respond and recover to an event and to do that we've built training now that you can take for free through the Kansas SBDC and so the training that we've built is very simple training right now it's it, it's a a voiceover of me talking about what simple changes you can make within your business to help deal with these major issues the assessments that we have are updated regularly. They're very simple. I call them snack size learning opportunities um, because we like them to be short. Uh, a business owner does not have the time to sit down for two hours a day and listen to me drone on about passwords. So we try to keep them anywhere between as short as eight minutes. I think the longest one we have is 20 minutes. Um, we can create our, our trainings very quickly and launch them in our portal uh, thanks to the, the uh, learning management system that we're using. And then we can also aggregate this data so we can start showing that Kansas is a safer place to be a small business in. And so if we can get Kansas businesses to start taking this training and to actively start making changes, we can show the business community that this is a great place to be. This is a great place to do business. And that is an economic development opportunity that we really should be utilizing. And so we're going to jump right in and I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes -ish or so uh, going through a lot of the areas that we cover. So when we start talking about identifying you know, a lot of people just don't, they, they haven't done this. Um, you know, putting together an inventory of, of what you actually have within your business that's connected. That's, that's an area that small businesses tend to not focus on. They might know that, you know, okay, I've got seven employees and all seven of them have a desktop. Okay, well, what devices are you also connecting to your network? 
Um, what software and what apps do you have installed on your devices? You know, when, when I talk to my small businesses, so many people nowadays, and I guarantee you most of you in this room have a smartphone of some sort. And I know a lot of you in this room have kids. And I know a lot of you in this room will let your kids play a game or two on their smartphone, on your smartphone. What data are you actually giving away? And what potentially could you be giving away from your business via your phone? We don't think about this, but it's something that is just really getting bad these days. The state of California actually a week ago launched a lawsuit against an app that has been uh, recording voices, taking data from those voice recordings, and selling that data to marketing companies. And those marketing companies work for Facebook uh, and Instagram. Um, the data that they've recovered, that, that they recovered, they're, re they're recording all of the time. Not only that, but this app is recording movements, so everywhere you go, um, and it's also recording every retail location you're in, so they can actually pinpoint you, and if you're walking down the aisle at Home Depot, and you happen to turn onto the paint aisle, you're going to get a message that says, hey, Benjamin Moore paints on sale today, did you know that? And so all of a sudden this very intuitive ad comes your way and you have no reason why. This app, and I, I want to see a ra some hands in this audience, uh, I guarantee you most of you have it. Who has a Weather Channel app on their phone? It's recording everything. When you agreed to download that app, you agreed to let them have everything. They have access to everything within your phone. Um, and it's terrifying. The, the Weather Channel app um, is owned by IBM. It's no longer part of the Weather Channel itself. Um, and it is a data mining organization. That's all they do is they mine data. And it's crazy because they've recently re-updated their, re their app. And I go on and check them out every once in a while. They, they actually have made it worse, but they've made it more intuitive to get more information out of you. Um, and so when, when that type of data mining is happening, what else are they getting from your business? And potentially what could people use for bad, for nefarious reasons? Yes, sir? Would you recommend uh, phones connected to organizations not um, You can try that, but let's be honest, you know, that, that, that is a big ask to make. Now, if it is a phone that you are paying for, um, you should be able to say what apps you're allowed to install. Uh, you know, and that will happen in a cybersecurity policy that you're putting together. Um, but yeah, if you don't want people to connect to your network, I mean, that's, that's a decision you can make, absolutely. Uh, but it has to fall with, it, it, there has to be some policy actually written down that says this. Um, a game maker out of the UK three years ago developed an app that was very popular and you had to download it and once you got the first download it had one of these user you know, user agreements and how many of us will just click on that user agreement just to make it go away. Um, within that user agreement was the uh, little small print um, that in perpetuity you agreed to give the game maker your ever loving soul. And a year after the release of this game, they emailed all of their users saying, congratulations, we're giving you your soul back. We just wanted to know you, let you know we owned it for about a year. And so these are the things that we're giving up when we're not identifying what we're putting in. You know, and so maintaining a list of devices on your network, this is so important, you know, especially as we're getting into the age uh, of so many devices that are connecting themselves. Um, I'm one of those smart home people. I enjoy it. I love my smart home device. I can walk in and tell Alexa to turn the lights on and lights come on. It's great. I can walk in the kitchen and tell Alexa to start playing music and music just comes out of nowhere and it's great. I love that. But the security of these things are terrible. Uh, especially if you're going to start putting these in your business. Um, a casino in Las Vegas um, had a thermometer in a fish tank that ran on Wi-Fi. You know, you wouldn't think that that would be a big deal. It was so the engineers could check the thermometer, the, the actual temperature in the fish tank at all times, uh, and sure enough, hackers were able to get into it via that fish tank. They actually got into the database that controlled all of the information on the largest gamblers in their casino, um, and they estimate somewhere between 10 and 20 million dollars in damage was done over the course of about two weeks. You know, and so understanding what's connecting to your network is extremely important. Creating a hardware inventory list, figuring out what programs you're using, and making sure they're updated. You know, this is something that we just don't do often enough. We, we will click ignore on an update because we just don't feel like having to restart our computers. But being aware of that. 
um, and then understanding specifically, you know, how are you inventorying the process? And something else that we all need to be aware of these days is software is global. You know, so many of our small businesses are using QuickBooks Online. Uh, and so, you know, where is the actual data for that being stored and housed? And, and are we sure that that data is safe? I'm a big fan of QuickBooks, and I think that it's probably got a, a pretty good security team working for it. But if you're utilizing other software that you're not very sure about, find out a little bit of information about specifically where they're storing your data and how secure is it. Um, keep your information updated and safe. You know, this is just extremely important if you have a fire, if you have some type of actual physical disaster, knowing what it, you had is going to be important. Understanding data is something that our small businesses don't think about. They, unfortunately, our, our small business owners don't think that the data they control is important, and it is important. Um, the, I, there are three black markets that are available in the dark web uh, to buy data from. And I have a laptop that I use specifically to go and check these. And I don't do anything else on this laptop except go to these markets because I like to understand it and to see what the value is. And the, the average value for a personal data set right now, which includes social security, home phone number, address, name, relatives' names, uh, goes for about 30 bucks a pop. You know, and so. 30 bucks a pop, you think, well, that's not that much. Okay, well, I have a client list of 30,000. Now, how much is it worth? You know, so people are actively stealing this data. Um, with the Equifax hack that happened in 2017, in September of 2017, um, I actually believe that there's a correlation between that and the rise of cryptocurrencies. And I think Will Katz and I probably have a conversation about this one day. So in September of 2017, Bitcoin was valued at about 4,500 bucks per coin. Um, the Equifax hack, happened in September of that year. By December, Bitcoin was valued at about $17,000 per coin. And that was because transactions where people were buying that data. And you could only buy it via Bitcoin, Monero, Ethereum, which are these cryptocurrencies that have been developed. The, the data was released. By about January, February of that of 2018, uh, the data became stale because people were no longer buying, and then you started to see the drop in cryptocurrencies. And so, there's actual money that's really being applied to this. And when we're not paying attention to our data, it's costing the world money. Uh, and so, there's still solutions out there like optical solutions. I actually have worked with small businesses who were still writing things on CDs, but that is going away. And so, that's something that we're just not seeing a lot of. Um, people are storing data on hard drives still. They're traditional. You know, they're cheap, easy to use, people know how to deal with them, um, but they're still physical. Um, and if you're just storing on a physical hard drive that you keep under your desk, um, that's not necessarily going to be the safest opportunity. Um, flash drives and flash drive, you know, the bas basically think of a USB drive. It's, it's easy, um, they're portable, transfer transferable, um, and as a cybersecurity person, um, they're terrifying. Uh, flash drives are exceedingly dangerous and people just don't realize this. So the flash drive that I carry around, um, I have a, a, an 8 gig flash drive that I bought and paid a ton of money for uh, because I understand who made it and what the manufacturing was and when I actually plugged it into my computer the first time it told me specifically what it was doing. The average flash drive carries, it, let's say you have a 4 gig flash drive, you're going to get it and plug it into your computer and it says it's got about 3.6 gigs worth of space to save stuff on. How much does it actually, how much uh, memory does it take to run a flash drive? It's a whole lot less than 0.4 gigs. And so what we know is that there's a lot of data that ends up on flash drives that shouldn't be there. Um, flash drives are also a huge marketing piece. How many of us have been to a conference where they hand out a flash drive with the manufacturer's name on it? Um, at the American Dental Association meeting in 2016 in Las Vegas, they had 30,000 people show up to this convention. It's Las Vegas, of course I'm going to go. Um, at this convention on the, the, the showroom floor, there was a company touting the latest and greatest CRM for dental offices. Um, and they went out and hired a bunch of really young, attractive looking people from Vegas who were wearing skimpy clothing and handing out flash drives left and right to every person that passed by. Over the course of a week, they handed out 18,000 flash drives. That company didn't exist. There was no software. The only reason they were there, that the only reason they paid the $10,000 registration fee was to hand out 18,000 flash drives. And it's estimated they did around 50 to $60 million worth of damages to dental offices in the United States and Canada because of a flash drive that was corrupted and people went back to their office and plugged it in. 
because that's what people do. Um, there's a, there's an, a, a test that a lot of cyber people will do, and Mehdi, I don't know if you do, you do penetration testing? So penetration testing is where somebody like Mehdi will come into your organization and figure out how easy it is to get into your organization. And one of the easiest things you can do is walk into a parking lot the morning before everybody gets there and drop a flash drive. It's like a wallet. Everybody wants to know what's in it. They're going to find it in the parking lot and they're going to go plug it in. And it happens. Um, I've worked with a bank located in Kansas, will not say where, but it wasn't Lawrence, but there was a bank in Kansas um, that this happened to and the guy who did the penetration test dropped three flash drives in the parking lot the morning before his test. All three flash drives were plugged in before 10 a.m. that day. And all three flash drives contained, one of them contained a keystroke, so they were basically taking in passwords. One of them actually contained a malware, and then another one contained a ransomware. And so, you know, these people knew, ex the, except for the keystroke, these people knew immediately that they had plugged something into their computer that was very, very bad. And so flash drives aren't necessarily the best opportunity for saving data. Uh, the cloud is an opportunity that, that has grown. And so we, what we like to see is kind of a, a dual source concept. And so if you're going to keep stuff on a hard drive, keep your data on hard drive, that's great. But also have a backup system that potentially backs up to a cloud. Um, it isn't perfect. The cloud systems, they're under attack. You know, when we look at who is the largest, you know, what city in the world has more active uh, cyber attacks against it than anywhere else, it always blows people away. You might think Washington, D.C., you might even think Moscow or Beijing. It's Redmond, Washington. Redmond, Washington is, has more hacks coming into it and more attacks coming into it every single day. And that's because that's the home to Amazon's cloud service system. The Amazon cloud system is the golden goose. If somebody can break into that system, they're going to be able to take half the world's cloud systems. And that's why Amazon pours a ton of money into their cloud security. Um, and so they're trying to keep it as safe as possible. But it's all the, you know, w right now we know it's a good opportunity to have a double backup. Um, there has to be a level of trust, and so, you know, if somebody shows up at your door and says, hey, I run XYZ cloud system out of my basement, you know, sign up with me, I would definitely do a little bit of, under, you know, education and find out if that's who you want to use. Um, but there are some great local cloud storage systems. There is a company that holds uh, cloud storage systems in the, the uh, Hutchinson salt mines. Um, and so, you know, there's cloud systems that are all over the place that potentially could be working for your business. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when they think about data, they think about just things like, you know, in personal information you might be carrying. But specifically nowadays, we also need to think about social media feeds. And so if your company utilizes social media, you should be saving these feeds specifically to, pr to help protect yourself down the road. Um, unfortunately, social media can do more harm to your business than good. And if you have one employee who goes rogue and decides to use your social media for rather than opportune purposes, you really want to be able to track who was posting, when they were posting, and actually have access to that. I don't suggest keeping it forever. Keeping it up to a year is probably going to be enough. Uh, and so doing that requires some sort of policy, actually saying, you know, we have a cybersecurity policy within our organization. So many small businesses don't. Um, you know, if, if you have not said you are not allowed to surf the web and go to these websites, you know, go to these types of websites, you're not doing yourself a favor. And so we want companies to create a concept policy. There are great templates out there available online. If you don't know where to start, if you just want to put something easy together, there is something out there that's great. Nothing, there is no one size fits all. It's not like you're going to find the perfect plan, but you can find something that will help you at least get there. You know, and also when writing a policy, we want to start talking about, you know, do you have a compliance issue to worry about? You know, if you're a bank, absolutely. And I guarantee you, if there's some bankers in here, and I know I see some back there, and you don't have a cybersecurity policy, we're going to talk. Um, but, you know, are you making sure that you understand the compliance within it? Also, are you in healthcare? Um, are you in some type of pro, um, organization that is carrying financial data that has to be accounted for in some type of compliance form? Are you swiping credit cards? You know, does your business swipe credit cards? Are you a coffee shop? You know, are you a restaurant? Um, are you PCI compliant? Have you just checked the boxes to say, yes, I'm PCI compliant, and you don't know what that means? Most people do, and they don't necessarily understand the idea behind it. Yeah, and so within a policy, we want to make sure it has an infrastructure. And so you know within your policy what programs you're using. How will we update programs? So specifically, if your employees are using computers and every day they're clicking the box to go away, um, 
it's going to be a little bit of back-end protection on you. So if your company gets hacked or if, you, if your partners get hacked because of it, you can have a little bit of, I didn't do it, it was this person that didn't follow a policy concept. Understanding how you backup data, who has access, and who's going to train new users all needs to be within a cybersecurity policy. And then understanding you know, what employees, what's expected out of an employee um, within a cyber uh, a system. When we start talking about employees in, in your business, you want to make sure that they understand that they can do just as much damage as, as a hacker. They can leave systems open. They can potentially open you, your, your business up for a whole slew of attacks. Um, you know, when we start thinking about some of the attacks that have happened in the past, one of the big ones for me is uh, the Target hack that happened, oh my gosh, now almost eight years ago. And so when Target was breached, uh, it was $163 million in damage that was done to Target Corporation that Target reported. Uh, but then when you look at the numbers, it was much bigger than that. Um, in 2010, Target bought uh, 300 retail locations of a company in Canada. By 2013, all 300 were closed. They lost a billion dollars in the Canadian market. And you can definitely blame that on the hack and the breach that occurred where so many people lost faith in the Target Corporation and stopped spending money. The thing that blows people away is Target was never hacked. They weren't. Target basically was open, somebody opened the door into the Target system through an air conditioning repairman in Pennsylvania. So there was an air con a small business, it was an air conditioning repair guy in Pennsylvania. I say small, probably, you know, he did about a million dollars a year in sales, and so decent little business. Um, and he went to work on a Target air conditioner in just outside of uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania plugged his computer into the target de uh, uh, air conditioning system, which was tethered to several different other systems within the business, which then allowed the little virus that had been sitting on his computer for years to wake up. And it was a 17-year-old kid in Russia who figured it out and did all of this damage. You know, so when we start talking about, you know, making sure your employees understand that your devices need to be pre protected, that's what we mean. Um, forgetting passwords is an issue. How many times do you go to a website that you haven't been to for a while and you have to use a password and you have to click, you know, forgot password? How many of you use the same password for everything? You know, th this is one area that we have a big problem with. This is one of my favorite quotes. Passwords are like underwear. You don't let people see it. You should change it often and you don't share it with strangers. Um, <laughs> It's so true. You know, I've, I did a, a business continuity plan for a doctor's office in uh, the Kansas City Metro, and we were, I was actually walking down the hall one day as we were doing this plan and we were kind of auditing their systems, and I passed one office where one guy yelled, hey, what's the password for that program? And the other guy yelled it back as I was passing him. You know, and so it's just, it, passwords are a major problem. The number one password is still password. Still, it's still a password. When I started working with the Air Force, um, they kid and joke, but they still have high-ranking officials within the U.S. government who still use the password password. Uh, in 2015, a whistleblower um, turned in the executive team for Twitter to the Federal Trade Commission. And it was because the overarching uh, login to get into Twitter to basically be able to do anything on the Twitter platform. Uh, the username was admin and the password was password. And this was 2015. We're not talking about you know a decade ago. This was just three years ago. And so we're still seeing this. Characteristics of a strong password. Honestly, I put this together about six months ago and it's already outdated. You know, um, there, there is a, a little hacking club that's been built that likes to see how many password, like how long of a password they can hack with their this, the software they built, and their latest hack uh, program um, can hack a 55 character password in less than five minutes. And, you know, and so what we have is a password problem, and and this community, the cybersecurity community, has got to catch up with that. And we're doing that in, a, in several different ways that we're really starting to utilize now in small businesses as well. And so, you know, one of the one of the areas is biometrics. And so, like on your phone, so many of us have phones now where you know to get into it, you need a thumbprint. Uh, there's now retinal scanning. I, I could use a retinal scan on this computer, or actually, I could use a, a thumbprint on this computer. 
There's multiple opportunities for that. And there's always that one person that says, well, what if they cut off your thumb? I got way bigger problems if somebody just cut off my thumb than to worry about a password. But you know, we have to start thinking about what are these opportunities and options going to look like. Um, two-factor authentication. I'm a huge fan of two-factor authentication. Yes, it's annoying. Yes, every time I log into my email, I enter my password, and then it sends me a text message saying, was this you? And I have to do that every single time. But I also can't be the guy who walks around saying he's a cybersecurity expert and then gets hacked. And so I have to do these things, um, but we have to do it. And, and so two-factor authentication is becoming a big area of opportunity for us. Um, the name Frank Abagnale, do you guys know, remember him? So Frank Abagnale was a uh, con artist who was really active in the 60s. Uh, and there was a movie made about him where Leonardo DiCaprio played him and Tom Hanks played the FBI agent who was going after him. Frank Abagnale is now one of the leaders in two-factor authentication for cybersecurity. So he owns part of a company called Trusona, and that's what they're actively doing these days. And so when the, the con artists are getting involved with this, um, you, know, you know that they're really serious about it. Every different account gets its own password. I... Yeah, it's terrible. I, I know that I do account, I'm at 32 um, different accounts that I use daily that need different passwords. Um, and so that's almost damn near impossible to remember. And so things that we can suggest are password managers. You know, password managers aren't perfect. Just like a cloud system, um, they're storing this data and potentially out there, there's somebody who's gonna crack it open. But right now, we don't have many other much better options. And, and so can a password protector keep you safe? Yes. Will it keep you safe forever? Probably not. And so there, that's why we're actively working to get rid of passwords. Um, the cyber community and cyber theorists and experts are, are guessing that somewhere between five and 10 years from now, no systems will be utilizing passwords. We'll utilize different concepts to get into them. Um, if you want to have some fun with your password, go to howsecureismypassword.net. This was actually built by some uh, old Air Force guys, um, and they will tell you within time how long it'll take to actually crack your password. Um, when I started my dive into the cyber world, I was at, I think, three milliseconds for them to crack my password. And now I'm up to 34 years, which I'm pretty pleased with. Um, my wife's password is still, I think they could crack it in like seven hours. And so, you know, we, we just, it, if you wanna kind of get a concept of what potentially is out there, that's a good one to do. Antivirus software is not enough. Um, there are all kinds of attacks that are happening. There's this you know, theory called a zero day attack, which is um, an attack where uh, antivirus programs didn't even know anything about it. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're thinking kind of ahead of the, your antivirus protection. Uh, connected machines, are, it doesn't mean you're completely immune to viruses. You know, and so what we need to do is run a modern system. If you're still running a system that uses Windows XP, Windows XP, stop, go home, leave, just walk out right now and go buy a new computer. Um, and, and I wish that it didn't have to be said, but it does. What we unfortunately are dealing with right now, specifically in healthcare more than anywhere else, um, are computers that are up to date and running the most recent um, uh, operating systems. Um, but we have machinery, specifically x-rays, um, uh, CAT scan machines, you know, all of these machines still run on Windows XP and they carry data and they're completely unprotected. Microsoft has stopped protecting anything that runs XP, um, but our healthcare system can't afford to buy new machinery. You know, and so we, we have a problem. And so this is something that we really want to focus on is running modern systems and then keeping it updated. Stop clicking the ignore box to make it go away. If your computer says, it's, I need to update and restart, Go get a cup of coffee, you know, and, and let your computer reboot and do its thing, so you, you can you can get through that. Um, ask yourself if you're making yourself a target. You know, are you doing anything potentially online that could bring harm to your business through a cyber way? Sherry. Mm -hmm. Well, it just depends on how safe you feel your computer is. You know, so do you feel like your computer is 
running a really great protection program and nobody could potentially get in and then even worse could somebody who works for you come right behind you one day and start logging into things Are, Password managers are an option. You know, I, I'm the same way. Yep, absolutely. So KeyPass, LastPass, these are password managers. And just if you go Google password managers, you'll come up with a couple of different ones. What they're going to do is they'll create ridiculously complex passwords that are hard to crack. And it's kind of like Lord of the Rings. And you have one password to rule them all to get into the password manager. Um, but that, will, that, that offers a, a, some level of stability. It, it, the password situation right now sucks. I, I wish it, it was a better way to describe it, but it's not. We, we have a problem with passwords, and, and we're not going to get past it until we can get past the concepts of passwords. And we're, that'll, you'll start seeing that happening in the next few years. Uh, you know, but so one thing that small businesses forget about is they, they tend to make themselves target, specifically in the age of social media. When you're a small business in Lawrence, Kansas, and you decide to start railing on politics in either direction, don't do it because you're making yourself a target. Um, people will potentially decide to hack you specifically because of things you've said. Um, or things you've did, you've done. When I uh, got the the position here as director of the Cybersecurity Center for Small Business and put that on my LinkedIn profile, within two hours I had like 22 people trying to hack everything I owned. I mean, people just go after anybody who considers themselves a pseudo expert, even in cybersecurity. Um, you know, when you're choosing a virus protection that fits your needs, you know, you, you have to start asking questions. Is it going to cover everything in your office, not just your, your uh, desktop computers? Will it cover your phones? Yes, you need virus protection for your phone. A lot of people don't think about that. Um, can your program be audited if you're required by uh, some type of compliance regulations to be audited? You want to make sure that it offers that. Does it have a firewall? You know, these are the simple things that you want to know and, and, and before you get going. Um, so what is good cybersecurity behavior? It's, it's not easy, that's for sure. When I got my first email address in 1993, um, you know, if I got an email from a relative, I knew immediately, well, that's an email from my brother who just emailed me. Um, nowadays, I can't actually be sure that that's correct anymore. Uh, we're getting emails all the time from strangers who were claiming to be somebody related to you, or they know someone that's related you're related to, and they're potentially asking for money or asking for assistance. Um, the largest, really, the, the largest growing sector of theft that's happening in the cyber world right now is happening through email and it's happening through the real estate world. Um, there was a dentist just here recently who transferred $88,000 for the down on a, for, as a down payment on a new house um, and that money never showed up to where it was supposed to go. He got an email from the title company saying, you know, here's the, here's the routing a number and, sh and uh, account number for this, uh, this wire transfer. Go ahead and send the, send your down payment and you know, all will be well. Um, that email came from the name of the guy he'd been working with. It even had the signature that he had been seeing, um, but it was fraud. You know, they don't know where the money went, and now everybody's suing everybody trying to figure it out. But now we have to start checking things. You know, when my organization gets called and says, you need to pay this invoice, I'm actually going to pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, are, you know, is this correct? I want to make sure I've got the numbers right. Um, understanding that there's social influence. A lot of people, you know, we've come so accustomed to just walking away from our computers. Uh, we potentially will get, we'll go home and use our laptops at home um, and connect to all sorts of crazy things. And then we bring that laptop back to work and potentially could infect our, our, our systems at work. And so we want to make sure that that social influence stays away. Social media is a big problem. Facebook, uh, Facebook Twitter, Instagram, all of that, um, it's, it's awful for security issues. Uh, 650,000 Facebook accounts are hacked on a daily basis. That's not from Facebook. That's from numbers that the government has put together in an estimate. Um, Facebook won't give real numbers, and the government believes that this is probably on the low side. They're thinking most likely it's closer to 1.5 to 2 million. And so think about all of those people who are connecting to Facebook and they're using the same password to get into their work email. They're using the same password to get into their bank account. How many people do that? And that's, that's one of those areas that we need to focus on. 
Um, the users that we deal with have, again, the, the, they have no awareness of what threats are actually out there. Um, I work for the University of Kansas and, and they're fantastic, uh, but probably for the last two months, and I think you guys probably could clarify this, we we get emails. I, I got an email from the dean of the School of Business at 4.06 a.m. a few about a month ago that said, hey, are you awake? I really want to talk. Why in the hell would the dean of business be emailing me at 4.06 a.m.? You know, and so somebody got had some type of phishing attack that where they gave away some credentials and now we're getting emails at least once a week from somebody high ranking in the in, in the at the university we got another one this week um saying hey are you around i want to talk or hey i know it's late but i'd really like to chat you know and so they're hoping that people will respond to it and begin giving away more information and so that knowledge level we just we've got to begin beefing it up within our organizations and so this has to come from the top down um, organizations that, that, you know, where the, the president of the organization's password is password and he tells everybody that and brags about it, which I've actually dealt with, um, that, that's not a good way to lead. I mean, you have to begin adopting a, a cybersecurity concepts and really understand that negativity doesn't influence. When, you know, if your company falls victim to a ransomware attack and it's going to happen, $23 million in ransomware attacks happened in Kansas last year. Um, you can't put the person who accidentally clicked on the PDF, you know, in front of your business and tar and feather them. It, it does. It's not going to do anything, anyone any good. What you want to do is actually talk to people about this, put out policies that work, and get them to understand. And so, when you've been breached, what are you supposed to do, and and, and how do you even know? Um, the FBI. This was now a decade ago, it was actually a guy named Robert Mueller, I don't know, I've heard about him somewhere, um, said that he, this was a, a direct quote from him, there, there's only two types of companies, th those that have been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. You know, and it's just getting worse. Every company out there has been breached in some way, shape, or form. Whether you know it or not, your company has had some type of you know issue. I remember with the chamber here back probably six or seven or five or six years ago, an email went out and it wasn't from the chamber, and it was asking folks for something. And y'all dealt with it pretty quickly and very well. And so you know you have to be prepared to do something about it. You know, and you, so to. To get there, you have to start asking specifically more questions. You know, what information are you carrying that potentially could bring harm to your business, could bring harm to your customers? Um, a lot of people don't think that they carry anything of value, and I guarantee you, you're wrong. You've got something on your systems that somebody else wants, and why would they want it is a question to ask. Um, I took a phone call a few months ago from somebody who was bragging about her new point of sale system. And she was saying that she had gotten a point of sale system and, and she had been told by her SBDC consultant to call me and talk about it. Because this point of sale system um, would run credit cards at no charge. And so she didn't have to pay the bank any processing fees. And she even, at, when she would run the card, she would get the full name on the credit card, she would get all 16 digits, she would get the expiration date, she would get the, C, the CCV number on the back, um, <clears throat> And she would get the address of the person. And that all got stored on a nice little database on this little tablet that she had gotten to swipe credit cards with. And when I asked her where she got it, she said, I don't know, it came from somewhere in Russia. And so this was a company, this was a, a, she was actually a food truck and she wasn't even here, it was in Delaware. Um, and she uh, had to call every single person who had used her service for the last six months and tell them that they had a data breach. And they had to go replace her credit cards and she had to pay for credit uh, uh, monitoring for two years. You know, and so she had a ton of information that she just didn't think anybody would really want. How could information be stolen from your system? You know, we have a ton of people who believe, you know, well, I know that I turn my computer off and everything's fine, um, but, you know, are you really following through with protocols? Are you making sure that you don't walk away from a computer? Um, the actual attacks that are happening against small businesses, you would be amazed at how many of them are physical. How many of them are actually started by somebody within your business who might just want a password? Or somebody in your who works for you who might just want to have access to your email for a second? Um, 
when I did a, a, this same doctor's office that had about 50 doctors in this clinic in Kansas City Metro, um, for every terminal that was left open, if HIPAA were to come in, they could have le levied fines against them. And we got up to about $120,000 before we stopped counting um, for terminals that were left open where I could pull client records. You know, and so that's a major problem. Um, on the, the websites I was talking about earlier where you can buy and sell and trade and data, a personal information data set goes for about 30 bucks these days. If you can pull personal medical records, one medical record goes for $1,000 because there's so much information that's kept on that that can really be taken. Um, is your system re ready to recognize a problem? I mean, you know, if you have a virus protection that you paid 20 bucks a year for, it's not going to recognize that you have issues and it's not going to do the job you need it to do. You know, so you have to start thinking about what's your plan. And when we talk about the NIST concepts of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, um, one of the areas that they've missed is planning. You know, they have not put in a concept for w how to actually create that plan, and that's one of the areas that we focus on, is actually building a business continuity plan or a disaster recovery plan. And so the signs of attack, you know, when you start trying to log into your email address one morning and it says that you've entered the wrong, email, the, the wrong password and you know you didn't change your password, I mean, these are simple things that we hear about, but just people don't think that you might have been attacked. Um, if your system has gotten really, really slow, you know, and, and you have no idea why. Um, if you wake up one morning and realize your antivirus has been disabled for some reason or another, you know, these are the areas that you want to focus on and start understanding what to look for, for during a cyber attack. The hidden expenses of a cyber attack are crazy. You know, when we start talking about the breaches, the 90% of breaches that are effective are gonna impact small businesses. The cost to, t to cover this, it's just growing. The chip and pin system that we moved to several years ago allows the banks to now put the liability of fraud onto the business. Um, and, and that's just getting crazy expensive. You know, if you're breached, you have to notify all of your customers and how do you actually go about doing that? There's gonna be a cost associated with that. Uh, you're going to have to pay for credit monitoring for, business, for your customers. And so if you're breached and, you're, and their credit data is taken, potentially, I think in Kansas, it's two years of credit monitoring that you actually have to pay for. So when you talk about nine bucks and 99 cents a month for credit monitoring for 3,000 people for two years, there goes your, the, the, any money you were hoping to make. The liability for fraud is really down to, to our businesses now. Um, there really is no one left to blame. <clears throat> and... The, the banks don't want to take that blame anymore. Card replacement uh, is getting expensive. Um, replacing a, a credit card now can sometimes be as much as 10 bucks. And so again, if you have 3,000 customers that you're re replacing credit cards for, that is an expensive process. Um, if you've been breached, you're gonna have to upgrade your system. Uh, you're, you know, so now we're talking just a minimum upgrade. You could be spending $20, $25,000 just to make sure you've got a, a system that can be protected from further breaches. And then the most dangerous is damage to your brand. People will want to walk away from your business and never talk to you again if their information has been stolen. They take it as a personal front, and that's something that we as a society have to get over. Um, Cybercrime has overtaken the drug trade as the, the most profitable type of crime out there. Um, if I wanted to today, we could go to Best Buy and buy a laptop for a couple hundred bucks. Um, we could get online and download a ransomware kit for, I don't know, hundred bucks. Um, we could download 200,000 email addresses um, and pay just 30 bucks for that and then start sending out a ransomware to all 200,000 of those email addresses. And let's hope for a 0.0005% return. And then we charge 1,500 bucks for each of the ransomware attacks that happen. So we'll probably by the end of the day have $36,000 in cash sitting in an account somewhere. Would you rather do that or would you rather go sell drugs on a corner where you potentially could get arrested, get shot, who knows what could happen to you. And so the crime is, is out there and we as a society, for some reason, still blame the victims when it comes to cyber crime. Um, but criminals are just growing by leaps and bounds. Um, in 2017, uh, Interpol uh, raided a company in Estonia. And Estonia is situated in between Finland and Russia, kind of in Scandinavia. 
Um, this company had 500 employees. They had a Google style campus with, they would uh, bring in lunch every day and they had like the catered cafeteria type thing where you could basically order anything you wanted. Um, they had a fitness center with personal trainers. They had on-site daycare and they had one of the best 401k programs in Europe at the time. And the only thing this company did was cyber attacks. That's all they did. And when Interpol came in and arrested them, the Estonian government protested, saying, you can't shut this business down. They drive our economy. Yeah, and so that, that's a problem. Uh, when the stock market crashed in 2009, it was the best year ever for Rolls-Royce. They've never made more money than they've, 2009, they made more money than they'd ever made before. And they didn't sell a single Rolls Royce in 2009 anywhere in the United States. They sold them in Africa and Eastern Europe to cyber criminals who were making money hand over fist because people were trying to figure out ways to try to get money back. And so this is, the, you know, again, it's a criminal enterprise and we have got to stop allowing our brands to be damaged because we've been attacked. Marriott, you know, announced that, oh, what was it, 200 million accounts had been hacked in December. It's done nothing to their stock price. Their stock price drip, dro dropped a couple of percentage points, about 6% actually the first day of the breach, but they've bounced back um, because they are spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year on brand protection. When we have a small business in Lawrence, Kansas, that has to do the same thing, Chad Lawhorn's going to write an article about it. I love Chad, but, you know, it's not going to do the business any favors. Um, and, and there's not really, they're not going to have the money to pour into marketing saying, you know, please forgive us. What can we do to make this better? We are the victim. That just, in, in the cyber crime world, that's still a problem. And, and that's a huge issue that we're dealing with. I had a, a client call from Topeka who had been breached. Um, she was taken for about 5,000 bucks. Grand scheme of things, that's not much. Um, she went to the police and said she wanted to file a complaint. The police said, what's the crime? And she, well, $5,000 had been stolen. Well, it was stolen from somebody in Canada, and so there's nothing we can do about it. So she called the FBI, and the FBI said, this is a crime. We definitely believe it's a crime. We want to help you investigate. What we need first is a police report. And the police wouldn't write a report. And so she called them back. Again, they weren't interested. Uh, and so this lady, who is one of the most tenacious people I've ever met, she actually tracked down the guy who stole the money. And it was a kid who actually lived in Anchorage, Alaska, who had routed the money through a bank in Canada. Um, and she talked to his mom. <laughs> And, and the mother even said, he's been doing this to people all over the world. You need to have him arrested because I don't know what to do. And again, the police in Anchorage, Alaska said, well, the crime happened in Canada technically and there's nothing we can do about it. And so law enforcement is not catching up. They're trying to figure out what to do. And anytime someone's breached, I, I, my first thing is call the police. Let them know a crime has occurred. Um, the, the law enforcement community, they, they feel a little overwhelmed by it, but it can, you know, we, we need to start treating it like it's a crime because it is. Uh, because people are getting away with it. You know, it, it's just insane how much money, is, trillions of dollars are being lost every year uh, to cybercrime and, and nobody is being prosecuted for it. I guarantee you, and Mehdi, you can probably back me up on this, there's people in Lawrence who are making tons of money on cybercrime. There's people in every community in the country making a ton of money on cybercrime, and they never break a sweat worrying that the LPD is going to come knock, knocking on their door. You know, they're more worried about Interpol. Interpol is the only organization out there who's doing anything significant, um, and they're not doing anything in the U.S. The FBI does, the FBI is really working, but they work on much bigger cases. And then they're caught so often chasing their tails off of bigger hacks. And so like FBI is involved in the Marriott hack and it, there's, a, there's a hack that you're going to hear about later in this week most likely called Collection One that happened this week where we're now up to 1.7 billion email addresses have been hacked. You know, so we're now talking that six of the world's population has been hacked and this happened earlier this week. And so they're going to be too worried about that to focus on the small business in Topeka, Kansas that lost 5,000 bucks. But that's who they should focus on, and, and that would stop a lot of it. 
responding to an event, if you're breached, you're going to be judged by your response. I mean, absolutely. If, if you do nothing, that is going to cost you money. Um, you have to have a team. You have to have a plan ready and you have to know who you're going to get to help you. Um, you know, do you have anybody in-house that can kind of act as a, a responsible communicator for you? Um, do you have an attorney that you can talk to you? You know, does your business have an attorney? Most likely. Does your business have an attorney who specializes in cybersecurity? Most likely not. And so can you find somebody who does? Um, securing your system after a breach, you know, you want to find somebody like, call Medi or call somebody like Medi and say, hey, you know, what do I do? What's my next step? You know, what can I do right now to stop this from going on? Sometimes it's as simple as pulling it from a, pulling the computer, disconnecting it from a wall. So many of the ransomware attacks that are happening right now are working off of really poor programming and really old code, but they're just easily downloaded. And so, you know, the, the ransomware kits that are out there, they might actually take 90 seconds to a minute to a couple of minutes to actually deploy. And if you disconnect your computer in time, you can stop it from moving across a network. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and then you're going to have to conduct a thorough investigation, you know, figuring out, you know, who will lead this. And so this is information you want to release and you want, let, you want to let people know so you can manage the public relations nightmare that's going to happen after a cyber breach. Um, people will want to know what happened. It, it's, it's one of those things where, where they love to hear the horror stories. You know, the anecdotes that I tell and the stories that I talk about, that's what people remember every time I give a, a, a presentation on this. I mean, you're not going to walk away, you know, knowing identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. A lot of people just don't remember that. But you will walk away saying, do you hear that crazy story about the flash drives and the dental association? <laughs> you know, that's what people remember and they love those stories. And so building your business back, you know, it's all about communication. Communicating to your employees, your customers, your stakeholders, even the government, even the general public, somebody who's never even come through your business. You want to make sure that everyone knows that A, you were a victim. You did not intentionally go out and ask for somebody to break into your business, but they did. And so it needs to be treated like a crime and you need to communicate that this has happened. Um, talk to your insurers. A lot of insurance companies are now carrying cybersecurity insurance. There's a problem with it. Um, your company has to be actively hacked by a nation state, really, to get a cyber insurance policy paid. And so somebody in North Korea has to say, um, okay, Midco, I'm coming after you guys specifically. And that's not how it really happens. Hacking is just luck of the draw. Um, and attacks are really luck of the draw. And so when the insurance company says, well, if somebody clicked on a ransomware link inside your business, we're not going to pay for that. And if somebody opened an email that allowed a phishing scam to happen, we're not going to pay for that. You know, so what is your cyber policy really paying for? You know, to make sure that Iran can't come in and hack your system? Well, that's great, but you know, is it really going to help your business if an attack happens? Start learning from others. You know, people are being attacked and not talking about it. And as a community, we've got to start talking about it. We need to start saying, this happened to me, and this is what I did to make a difference. Um, pay attention to the mistakes that others make as well. Um, double checking backups is really important, you know, and so when you talked about data earlier and where you're storing it, you know, if you're double storing your data, if you've got it on a hard drive and you've got it in the cloud, um, if you have a ransomware attack, you actually might be able to save everything. Um, Butler County, Kansas in oh, October of 2017, um, the entire uh, county office system was, had a ransomware attack and it was a good one. Um, they went after everything and fortunately Butler County had some backups that they were storing on a cloud that they had kind of forgotten about, um, but they were able to restore everything. And they learned pretty quickly that, you know, how terrible a ransomware attack could be. Um, and that ransomware attack was base was a test and it, it was a test by the people who, who did it. Uh, and a few weeks later, after successfully attacking uh, Butler County, Kansas, they attacked Atlanta, Georgia. We don't know if Butler County paid anything. It's never really been reported if they paid part of the ransom. Atlanta paid $750,000 a day for 21 days to get their data back. They didn't get a thing back. That, you know, they successfully shut down the Atlanta jail system. They turned off Atlanta's water, uh, so you couldn't do water billing. 
Uh, so not the water. They turned off the water billing system so you couldn't bill for water. They turned off so many different programs in the city. And the city was trying desperately to get it back. And they paid 750000 a day. They were millions and millions of dollars in the hole and never got a thing back. Because ransomware, um, most people don't know how to reverse it. Once something's been encrypted, the, the software to actually de-encrypt, it, it's hard. I mean, the government has an issue with it. And so ransomware, it's really good um, if you can encrypt and most likely you're not going to get your data back anyway. Uh, and then if you've been attacked, evaluate your business. What went wrong? What can you do better the next time? Uh, and what can you do right now to make sure you're not part of that percentage that, that is going to go out of business in six months? Uh, and so that's what we focus on. Um, and so I'm going to leave this up here. This is just 10 tips for your small business uh, and you can read through them. And I'm actually going to send this presentation to uh, Lindsay. And so if anybody wants it, they can have at it. Um, thank you guys so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I unfortunately uh, will be moving on. I, I have taken a position in Wisconsin and will be heading out of Kansas in the next, in the next month or so. Uh, but I enjoy this immensely and have enjoyed working in Kansas. And what I'm really excited about is the program that we've built. It, it's here and it's working and it doesn't need somebody right now to be the face of it anymore. I think that we can actually launch this thing and people can start using it. The trick is we have to get our small businesses to care. Uh, and so for, you know, for Kansas to really build itself up as the safe place to do business and that can offer us as an economic development tool to bring in larger companies, we have to start acting that way. And so this, is, this will help us get there. Mm -hmm.